moving on to thrombophilia. Thrombo means clot and philia means loving. So these conditions love to make clots. The ones that we shall discuss in this video include antithrombin deficiency, proteins S and C deficiencies, factor V Leiden, prothrombin gene variant, hyperhomocysteinemia, and antiphospholipid antibodies. Now, if you do not know what the first five are, so antithrombin, proteins S and C, factor V, and prothrombin, then please go back and have a listen to our secondary hemostasis video to refresh your memories. So again, thrombophilia is defined as conditions or pathologies that love to make clots. Now, clots can either form in the veins or in the arteries. More commonly, these are venous clots, for example, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. Let us consider the causes of thrombophilia. These can be inherited, for example, deficiencies in natural anticoagulants, such as antithrombin and proteins S and C. We could also have an increased level of clotting factors, for example, factor VIII. And we could also have inherited polymorphisms, such as factor V Leiden and prothrombin gene variant. The acquired etiologies include antiphospholipid antibody, malignancy, and hyperhomocysteinemia. There can also be acquired elevations of factors or deficiencies of natural inhibitors. To appreciate the risk factors for thrombophilia, we need to consider Verkau's triad. We shall discuss the triad and the associated features. The triad consists of disruption to blood flow, endothelial damage, and a hypercoagulable state. You can remember the components of Verkau's triad by using the mnemonic HED or HED, H for hypercoagulable, E for endothelial damage, and D for disruption of blood flow. Now this is what the triad consists of. There is no order to what comes first. The components can occur in isolation or all together. So one or more components of the triad can be the cause of the thrombophilia. We shall consider each component individually. Let us start with disruption to blood flow. This can take two forms, stasis or turbulence. In stasis, there is no movement of blood flow. The blood is still. This increases the chances of clot formation. If we use primary hemostasis as an example here, if you remember from primary hemostasis, after endothelial damage, we have reflex vasoconstriction of the blood vessel. This is to slow down blood flow within the region and allow for clot formation. So in stasis, there is no blood movement at all. So this significantly increases the chances of clot formation. In turbulence, there is no lamina flow. Blood moves through the blood vessel haphazardly without any order. This also increases the chances of clot formation. Turbulent flow usually occurs at arterial bifurcations, whereas stasis usually occurs in the venous system. Comparing this to normal circumstances, normally blood flow is laminar, as we can see in this picture. So what are the causes of disruption to blood flow? These include immobility, which results in stasis, cardiac wall dysfunction, for example, atrial fibrillation and myocardial infarction, aneurysms, and stenosis, which results in turbulent flow. There are, of course, other causes. Moving on to endothelial damage. So again, here we have a blood vessel lumen. The endothelial cells line this lumen, and for some reason, we have damage. It would be good to discuss the protective roles of the endothelium, which are similar to that of the basement membrane we've previously discussed in primary hemostasis. So first, the endothelium is a barrier. It protects the subendothelial collagen and tissue factor. Remember, both of these are required for the activation of the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, respectively, in secondary hemostasis. Second, it also releases PGI2, which prevents platelet aggregation. And third, it releases nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. Fourth, it also releases or expresses heparin sulfate, 
which, remember, activates and propagates the activity of antithrombin-3. Fifth, it also releases or expresses thrombomodulin, which, remember, activates protein C, and protein C inhibits factors 5 and 8. And finally, it expresses TPA, which is important for the conversion of plasminogen into plasmin. There are many causes of endothelial damage. These include atherosclerosis, vasculitis, and hyperhomocysteinemia. We will discuss atherosclerosis in the cardiology series and vasculitis in the rheumatology series, but let us here discuss hyperhomocysteinemia. You don't necessarily need to memorize the pathway, however understanding it will allow you to appreciate many pathologies. We shall discuss two causes of hyperhomocysteinemia. The first is B12 and foliage deficiencies, and the second is cystathionine beta synthase deficiency. Let us start with B12 and folate. When we consume folate, it is converted to tetrahydrofolate. This is rapidly methylated. B12 sees this and takes the methyl group off tetrahydrofolate, so we end up with B12 attached to a methyl group and free tetrahydrofolate, which goes off to synthesize DNA precursors. Now, homocysteine sees this and takes the methyl group off B12, so the B12 is now free and homocysteine is converted to methionine. Methionine goes off and transfers methyl groups elsewhere. So again, we start off with tetrahydrofolate. This is rapidly methylated. B12 sees this and takes the methyl group off tetrahydrofolate. So we end up with free tetrahydrofolate that goes off to synthesize DNA precursors and methylated B12. Homocysteine then sees the methylated B12 and takes the methyl group, forming methionine and freeing up the B12. Methionine can now transfer the methyl group elsewhere. So, if we have a deficiency in folate or a deficiency in B12, we end up with an accumulation of homocysteine. This is how B12 and folate deficiencies result in hyperhomocysteinemia. Secondly, in cystathionine beta synthase or CBS deficiency, we start with methionine. This is converted back to homocysteine via the methyl cycle. Serine then attaches to homocysteine via the action of CBS to form cystathionine. If we have low CBS, we end up with an accumulation of homocysteine. We shall discuss more about methionine metabolism and the activated methyl cycle in the metabolism series. If you're interested in reading more, I've included a reference. And finally, we have the hypercoagulable state. This can be due to excessive procoagulants or a deficiency or defective anticoagulants. Let us go through these. First, we have antithrombin deficiency. Remember, antithrombin is part of the natural anticoagulation system. It is activated by heparin sulfate on the endothelial cells and basement membrane. Antithrombin functions by inactivating thrombin and coagulation factors. Therefore, a deficiency means there is no regulation of the coagulation cascade. Antithrombin deficiency can be inherited as an autosomal dominance disorder or acquired through, for example, trauma. Importantly, patients might be resistant to heparin because, if you remember, heparin augments the activity of antithrombin. Proteins C and S deficiencies can also cause a thrombophilia. This is because a decrease in protein C means there is reduced inhibition of factors 5 and 8 of the coagulation cascade, as well as reduced induction of fibrinolysis. Importantly, there is an increased risk of warfarin skin necrosis. This is because warfarin, remember, reduces the vitamin K-dependent factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, and anticoagulant proteins S and C. Now, proteins S and C have a shorter half-life than the factors and thus degrade first. Therefore, warfarin paradoxically causes a hypercoagulable state, as proteins 2, 7, 9, and 10 are at an increased ratio compared to anticoagulant proteins S and C. This increases the risk of thrombosis, which usually manifests as skin necrosis. 
Now on to factor 5 Leiden. This is a polymorphism of factor 5. So it is a genetic mutation where factor 5 lacks the cleavage site for deactivation by proteins S and C. Remember these proteins usually inhibit factor 5, and if they fail to do so, there will be excess activity of factor 5. So if we remember the common pathway, increased activity of factor 5 means there's increased risk of clot formation. Factor 5 Leiden is a substitution mutation where arginine at position 506 is replaced with glutamine. Importantly, this is also the most common inheritable cause of hypercoagulability in Caucasians. Prothrombin gene variant is also a polymorphism. It is a point mutation that leads to an increased gene expression of prothrombin and thus clot formation. Let us now talk about antiphospholipid syndrome. This is one of the acquired causes of thrombophilia. We shall discuss this topic in more detail in the rheumatology series. The classical presentation of antiphospholipid syndrome is a female who has had multiple miscarriages and thrombosis, for example, DVTs and PEs. The antibodies involved are lupus anticoagulant antibodies, anticardiolipin antibodies, and beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibodies. The mechanism is still being researched and investigated. However, it is believed to involve the upregulation of tissue factor and thromboxane A2, as well as the disruption of the annexin-5 shield. The clinical features of antiphospholipid syndrome can be remembered using the mnemonic CLOTS. C stands for CLOT. You might see an increased APTT, but this is only in vitro. It is very important to note this. This is not a true increased APTT, so the patient does not have a prolonged APTT. The reason for this is that lupus anticoagulant impairs the phospholipid-dependent activation of factors 10, 11, and prothrombin. So again, you might see an increased APTT, however this is only in vitro and not a true increased APTT. The L stands for levido reticularis. This is a mottled discoloration of the skin. Reticular here means net or lace-like. The O stands for obstetric complications, and we've previously mentioned that patients tend to present with recurrent miscarriages. The T stands for thrombophilia, so patients can develop DVTs and PEs. The T also stands for thrombocytopenia. The reason why patients can develop a thrombocytopenia is because the antibodies can also label the platelets for destruction. The risk factors for venothrombosis include, but are not restricted to, increased age, increased BMI, varicose veins, continuous travel, immobility, pregnancy, previous DVTs and PEs, and estrogen therapy. We will finish by talking about heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. This is an uncommon and rare presentation and occurs usually within the first two weeks of first heparin exposure. So what we have here is heparin and platelet factor 4 or PF4 expressed on the platelets. Heparin binds to the PF4. In some individuals, the immune system does not like this complex, so it produces IgG antibodies against it. These antibodies bind to the heparin PF4 complex on platelets, marking it for splenic destruction. Importantly, the immune system also activates platelets, causing platelets to degranulate and release their ADP and thromboxane A2 stores. This results in clot formation. If you have forgotten what these are, please go back and revisit our primary hemostasis series. So, you end up with both thrombocytopenia and thrombophilia. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia can also occur one day after the second exposure to heparin. Treatment involves stopping heparin and starting an anticoagulant, such as dabigatran, 
which is a direct thrombin inhibitor, but more on that later. Please like, subscribe and share our content with your friends and on social media pages. Our mission is to develop need to know video content and question banks that remain free for your use. We are unable to keep doing this without your support. Thank you.